you commute into the office on the same train each day. You get to the office, you get your coffee, you sit at a desk, this piece of wood, and you're there for eight hours. It's like a prison to me. It's the physical environment that's built to separate and silo. Okay, well you don't need to know this kind of information. You should only know what you need to do to stuff this tube into this bottle or whatever. We're now tethered to devices that beep at us all day long. 47 reply alls that consist of two word answers. On average, 77% uh, of the UK workforce feels that a productive day in the office is clearing their email. Oh my God. You know, it's just shocking to think that actually the process of work has become work itself. When did, when did that happen? A study in the UK a few years ago showed that your average information worker, you know, was interrupted perhaps seven to 11 times an hour. And this resulted in men in a 15 point drop in IQ temporarily, which is the equivalent to being stoned. I mean, one recent French study, the chief executive said that only 11% of his workforce were really excited and enthused. 70% there was just a way to earn money to keep their family alive. And 19% who were actively prepared to sabotage the organization they disliked it so much. The world of work is changing. On the one hand, we have incredibly high levels of worker disengagement, and there are dire predictions that up to 50% of the jobs in the United States are at risk from automation in the next two decades. But on the other hand, we have new companies creating value faster than at any point in human history. We're seeing billion dollar startups inside a single calendar year. That kind of stuff is happening on the back of that information technology. And we can feel the potential. The digital world, brings us a tremendous amount of novelty and new ideas and new insights and new people, new relationships, new opportunities. People have an impact in society and their work uh, in a way that exceeds simply what their pocketbook can do. So what I see is just this untapped potential energy and it's all because of the systems and processes and mindset that we're using. If we just change the mindset, suddenly there's you know untapped capability, untapped potential. To learn at faster rates, to achieve our potential much faster. So you enjoy it and what you're producing is more valuable to other people. It's a win-win. When you think about the huge amount of untapped brain power, the closer we looked, the more we realized that the way we work has not kept up with the rapid pace of change in the world. The offices and cubicles we work in, the buildings that they're placed in, the software and the hardware that we use, they're really all designed for a world of information scarcity. But the world has really changed in the last decade, and we now live in a world of information abundance. People are collaborating, they're communicating with friends, they shop online, they play games, they have this wonderful, rich experience of technology in their personal lives, and then they go into the office. We naturally are beginning to look at our physical environments to have those types of performances. We expect them to be interactive, we expect them to be faster, we expect them to um, allow us to do things in a more spontaneous and intuitive way. We've been running companies the same way since the Industrial Revolution, when we made them purely for the purpose of doing the same thing over and over at scale as efficiently as possible. It was based on Ford and the production line. The Fordist approach was about pure efficiency, speed of production, uh, lowest cost. All Fords were black because black paint dried quickest. That whole construct is a dead construct, really. It belongs to a previous era. A couple of factors, among others, have changed. First is things have sped up, and that's self-evident. Things are faster, but they're also more interconnected. And when you combine the two, speed and interconnectedness, suddenly you have this unpredictability. So you don't know what tomorrow will be like. You don't know what next week, and you certainly don't know what next year is like. This world of information abundance, it's really defined on the one hand by this sense of being overwhelmed by constant communications and this constant flood of data and, and us having to cope with it. And on the other hand, it's defined by the immense creative possibilities. So I think what we're seeing is that the world of work is undergoing what I call a structural shift. How do we 
lead in this world? How do we create value? How do we organize ourselves, our organizations, our companies, obviously, to be able to uh, generate value collectively? How do we create a culture that allows for experimentation so that failure isn't punished? How do we budget in a world where we're changing priorities rapidly? How do we assign resources? How do we do management? There are so many challenges that people are slowly working through in this new world. The reality is I don't think enough organizations realize what's at stake here. We see right around the world examples of organizations who have failed to change. And so I think a lot of this change inside organizations is not about whether they're going to be successful or not, it's actually whether they're going to survive. The environment is at stake, people's health, a functioning society. It's the motor of our world and we need to get it right. To understand what was happening, we spoke to experts on the subject from around the world. Join us on our journey of discovery. One of the big dynamic shifts between the old sort of 20th century model and the 21st century model is this idea of predictability versus uncertainty. In the old model, things didn't change very fast, it was predictable, and so you built for predictability. It was like saying, go find this object in a well-lit room. New model is dark room. Who knows where the object is? And how do you behave, how do you operate in that uncertainty? Smaller moves, more frequent, more communication, more letting people know where you stand. That's the idea. So there's sort of this acceptance, this tacit acceptance of uncertainty in a responsive organization that says, not only is it complex, but it's unknowable. Things are faster, but they're also more interconnected. So what happens in a far off location in an area that otherwise wouldn't affect you now is connected. And when you combine the two, speed and interconnectedness, suddenly you have this unpredictability. So you don't know what tomorrow will be like. You don't know what next week, and you certainly don't know what next year is like. We have inherited, most companies have inherited, the systems that were built on the paradigm of the Industrial Revolution, that were responding to the industrial forces that were shaping society in those days, and that were changing, obviously, the worker from a factory worker to a white-collar worker, an office worker. These systems no longer no longer work. There's been one real central core priority for all companies for as long as we can remember, and that's efficiency. In a world of information scarcity, you knew what you had to do, the products and services you were going to provide, and the goal was to do them as efficiently as possible, as big a scale as possible. Well, today we really feel that incongruence because in a world of information abundance, we get instant feedback on everything we do. And so you've got to have adaptability to respond to changing conditions so organically. It has to be in the DNA of the organization so that it doesn't have to come from top-down directives that says, now we are going to produce a new version of this. Instead, it allows the organization to learn and adjust or adapt automatically. I think the factors that make a company successful have changed in the last few decades in the sense that it used to be about consistency and reliability. So what, what I can trust here, I can trust there, global scale, roll things out, national brands, the whole idea of an identity that you can rely on. Then information changed, digitization happened, and suddenly things were moving at a faster pace. Now it's really more about can you adapt, can you evolve, can I expect the product to get better every day? So it's almost a polar opposite idea than what we had before. Responsiveness, autonomy, empowerment, experimentation, transparency. The things that you need to do to become more responsive, to, to be able to learn quickly and respond quickly to what you learn, often feel like the opposite of efficiency. The reason this is creating such angst right now is that we get caught in this world where we have generation of generation of employee and, and leader and CEO trained to make the efficient decision, suddenly realizing they have to do these things that come contrary to everything they learn. And so this is gonna take probably a lot of new leaders, but it's gonna take a lot of people getting outside of their comfort zone, doing things that you know, their management books told them was wrong, or their mentor told them was wrong. These things that are deeply, deeply uncomfortable. One of the best examples I've heard of, of a company that's really orienting around responsiveness is Zara. 
Zara is well, one of the most profitable companies in a very tough business, young women fashion business. What Zara does is every day managers go to the store and ask people who return something to the rack why they return something to the rack. They know when they buy something, it goes to the point of sale system, automatic system. They don't know why they don't buy something. So they ask him, you don't like the lapel? You don't like the color? You don't like the cut? And they put all this information into an information system and they run it every night. Once in a while, they find a trend. You know, everybody doesn't like the lapel. The trend is fed immediately to a design center and we designers have the authority to redesign the garment send it to manufacturing, replenish the store. They realized that if they didn't run their factories at full efficiency, it allowed them to jump in the line and put stuff uh, for manufacturing quickly. So they run their factories at like 75, 80%, so that at any moment they could do a quick run of something new. You would never do that if what you were focusing on was efficiency. But they're focused on responsiveness, and so they're making these wild choices. It takes them three weeks to do this process. It takes every other company about nine months to go through this process. Decreasing the cost of failure, increasing the rate of experimentation, making themselves much more responsive. The way we look at a responsive organization is we look at characteristics that make you able to change in real time. So some of those traits that we've noticed are putting purpose ahead of profit, putting empowerment ahead of controlling people, valuing transparency even over privacy. Because if learning is paramount, then you have to sort of give something up in order to drive that agenda. Inside an organization that looks like having teams of people that are really tightly knit with information flowing around but that are empowered to kind of do their work in the way they see fit. So distributed authority, more speed, more iteration, more authority pushed to the edge. I think there's this whole speed issue of information and of change where there's an outside pace and an inside pace. So if the market is adapting faster than you or sharing information faster than you, then that can be problematic. I think the hardest thing about navigating the change from sort of a 20th century to a responsive 21st century mindset is this idea that we don't have control, that we don't know. You know, this idea that planning is no longer a super valuable activity. The faster things change, the less valuable those things become. And so you look at your annual plan from last year, maybe it held up for two months, three months before something changed and you had to navigate as you go. And I like to think about it as a boat ride. If you were going to take a boat ride across the Atlantic and you had two options, one was to steer once and then wait a year and then steer again, and the other was to steer every minute, of course you would choose the latter. Any traditional 20th century culture has learned to kind of push failure out. It's bad, it's a career killer, it's not the right thing, but that's because they only fail big. They make big moves to try and take big markets and everything is, is sort of thought of at scale. Will this scale? Common question. In the new world, you want to do smaller bets, smaller fails, more learning, and so the risk of getting it wrong is much lower. So you actually have kind of this fail to learn mentality, and even the idea or the notion of failure isn't really important as much as the search. What are we learning? What have we figured out today? What does the data tell us? It's not only okay when someone tries something and doesn't work, it also be not okay not to try something. What makes great work is when people have the capacity to go to, to test out the extremes and to know that they might try one thing and it's not gonna work, but it just means that they can find another direction. I'm gonna let everyone play enough and risk enough that they'll find something more interesting than if they just gone to the first solution. Success is not following the procedures and staying within the lines. Success is accomplishing your mission. And so one of the things we look at is, in terms of these patterns, when you test, when you learn, when you get data back, how is it then transmitted or made available to the rest of the culture? Learning is about the institution knowing something it didn't know before across the organization. So you can have an individual learn something, but the team didn't learn. The team learns, but the organization didn't learn. Now it's about having learning spread across the organization and then move with each successive wave of innovation. It's about overcoming the fear of failure being vulnerable enough to try something else, having space for experimentation without a punishing consequence. I hope we learn to become more like trampolines where failures 
are sort of happening, accepted and are just part of the process. That's to do with trust. I think we're, you know, to build a trust enabled team and collaborative environment is something where failure is a desired part of the process. One of the best metrics we have for detecting a responsive organization is employee engagement. So you look at how do people feel about their work? Do they bring their whole self to work? Do they feel engaged, energized? Do they have the authority to kind of do their job the way they see fit? All that leads to this pattern of, because I know I can do what I think is right, I'm gonna put more into it. Because I put more into it, we have more success. Because we have more success, I'm gonna lean into it further. If there's a purpose, if everybody knows they're getting behind a barn raising or something that they wanna create, the network will form. They'll galvanize the people that need to be there and they'll bring them together. We all need a narrative that fits with our sense of, our own sense of purpose, our own sense of being, that we can buy into. And the best talent is gonna to choose to be part of a culture and a purpose that's meaningful to them. So by putting purpose out there, putting it even ahead of profit, you're saying this is why we wanna gather these people to our cause. This is the interest that we all share. At the end of the day, you've gotta empower people at the lowest level. And people say, well, I empower you to make decisions. I'm going to decentralize decision making, but that's meaningless unless they're empowered with information. Typically, decisions used to go to the highest level that was informed enough to make the decision. Nowadays, we've got to make the decision down low, so we've got to give them all this information that used to be the purview, the owned by senior leaders. We've got to give that to people who maybe before were never given that kind of responsibility. We've got to give it to them, and then we've got to demand that they make the decisions. People say it's frightening and that they'll make mistakes. Well, guess what? Everybody's going to make mistakes. And I found that down the chain, they don't make any more mistakes than I would make at a higher level. The, the great term that, that I heard a lot was you've got to decentralize till you're uncomfortable and then decentralize some more. We find that people from almost any walk of life can kind of come into a responsive environment, very shocking at first but a few months in start to feel like, wow, this is different and, and I like it and I feel more engaged. So we, we do think it's a sort of curable uh, condition. You know, oftentimes when people talk about the future of work, they think about a lot of the software that will change, the physical environment that will change, and, and we can sort of imagine in our mind what some of that would be, but some of the more daunting challenges are actually just, how do we organize people? You know, when we have a problem in our personal lives, we can ask our friends on, on Facebook or you know, other social media channels. Sometimes we'll say, well, can you come over and help me? And they'll come help me. And the, the fluidity with which that we share information, help each other, and don't assume that we have to know everything, we work like a network with the people we know, with our families and friends. But in companies, we have all this weird baggage around even asking for help, admitting we don't know something, sharing what we're doing. The places people work today, there are networks that are very top-down, that are determined by the institution, the company, the employer, and it doesn't mesh with what we feel and see in our personal lives, of these loose networks that are dynamic. And so clearly there's gonna be a change. Everything is changing so that our work lives feel more like the rest of our lives, and networks are gonna reflect that as well. When we talk about working like a network, we're not just talking about your employees inside your company. We're also talking about how you work like a network with your customers, with your partners, so that all of those constituencies can share information and help each other create the best products and services. Most of our current productivity paradigms are really based on individuals doing individual work at individual workstations. And yet we know that in this fast-paced, real-time world of you know, information abundance, it's actually very, very hard today for any individual to wrap their head around all of the information and data and communications that are out there. The complexity of the stuff that we do has really demanded this really intense, you know, high-volume uh, collaboration between people. We all have to recognise that we don't have enough skills on our own to make something that's going to be extraordinary. As we become 
more and more specialized, as innovation increases, the need to rely on other people's competencies becomes even more important than it ever was. The idea of each person being his or her own island and handling everything has been gone for a while, but it's, it's slipping away even quicker now. Collaborating and working together are better strategies than struggling alone. This shifts value creation from the individual to the collective. As we think about teams in the future, and we can't think about the nine to five hierarchical enterprise structure that we have today, we really have to think about much more dynamic teams that are formed around projects that make use of you know, contingent labor, that make use of independent experts. And these teams will be formed and banded and disbanded again in a very, very fluid way. A little bit more like the Hollywood model, if you like, in the film industry. When Hollywood makes a movie, the first thing they do is they form a company for the purposes of making that movie. And then they subscribe talent to that movie for as long as the production lasts. And then when that's over, the company is dissolved, people go back into the great flow of human talent, and they wait for the next project to come along. It sort of atomizes a lot of careers, especially for folks that have white collar jobs, information worker jobs, where you start to assemble your work from a bunch of different projects, maybe different employers, it's a very, very different view of what our work is. We know that in the US by 2020, 40, perhaps 50 percent of the workforce will be contingent. It used to be the case that you could envision working for 30 or 40 years for the same company. Now people manage their careers in two and three and four year increments. It's not really about having an office full of 10,000 people anymore. You can have a network of 10,000 people that are technically not employed by the same person, but are working together to create something and build something. Work has become more global. The connections that we make and the collaborations that we undertake can just as easily be with some on the other side of the planet as they can be with someone who's around the corner. Teams of the future will be a collection of brilliance and experience that comes together just for a particular challenge or project or mini project. It will be a continuous lifelong learning process. Down at the individual level, you're going to have to have some skills that we probably didn't see before. One is going to be a confidence and a curiosity to know things that are not in your lane. We're going to have to say you have to have functional expertise, but you're going to have to have wide area consciousness of what's happening because what you do functionally must fit into the whole or it's of irrelevance. The second is risk taking, but we are going to have to tell people you have to take risks. We will underwrite those risks that are not a risk of a moral or legal nature. We'll underwrite even judgment errors because everybody's going to make them. That's how you're going to learn. The things that we used to think of as the things that sort of really didn't matter, it might make work marginally better, have become absolutely central to the task. Empathy, compassion, trust, cooperation matter more because innovation is a team sport, because the demands of the creative economy have accelerated. These kinds of skills have always been thought of as really soft, squishy, kinds of skills, but the reality is that they are really the, th the motor that makes joint creativity and makes uh, innovation really possible. The one thing we know about mindfulness is that we've, we've shown that practicing it for as little as eight weeks increases people's compassionate behavior automatically. And if you're building a team, that's hugely important because if people on the team are compassionate, what that means is you're building a resilient team. When one person fails, the others will come and support that link from the bottom up. Our ability to recruit others to our cause, our ability to see the nascent potential in an idea, requires them to be empathic with us and, and vice versa. When I talk about empathy and compassion and trust, the question of whether it's a must have or whether it's something nice to have often comes up. People think, oh, that sounds nice, but is it really going to affect the bottom line? And the answer is yeah. What it does is it increases a team's collaboration. It also makes them much more resilient and much more capable of adapting to any changes that come. All the models we know of in terms of evolutionary models of give and take suggest that groups that are more compassionate and more trusting over time have the best outcomes. We're in the middle of, of not just a a uh, technological change, I think, but really a cultural change that's impacting leadership down uh, to try to understand 
how to act in this new world, how to act in, in, in a world where we need each, each other's information to make better decisions. This is a huge change for most big companies today. The good news is that because we're just at the beginning of this generational change, even small investments, even small changes in this direction to become more responsive, I believe will yield disproportionate results. People are gonna figure out how to leverage the information better through having working like a network with their employees, customers, and partners, through leveraging the talents of their employees so that they can be empowered to make the right decisions. That's what's gonna make organizations successful in the future. One of the best examples of an organization that, that realized they had to change, realized they had to work more like a network, was the U.S. military. In fact, uh, I think it was Stanley McChrystal famously said, the wisest decisions are made by those uh, closest to the problem, regardless of rank. In the military and government world, there's always been a saying called need to know. The problem is it presumes that someone, the all-wise person, knows who needs to know and who doesn't. But in reality, you couldn't make the kind of assumption that everyone here needs to know and everyone else doesn't need to know because the environment changes too fast. We had to create what we call shared consciousness and that was giving everybody contextual understanding of not only the big picture, but the constantly evolving situation. We were able to connect our entire organization in real time and so the entire organization, like a human brain, is getting constant updates on the weather, the light, what your body is, what's happening, all these things. And instead of doing just what they've been told originally, they can adapt that to what the conditions are. And very quickly, it starts to happen so fast and the connectivity gets so strong that the organizations only need that constant shared consciousness and a general direction in which we're moving to be able to adjust and act with much greater uh, effectiveness, much greater wisdom, because they're closer to the problem. There are some process and procedural things that have to change, but the biggest ones are culture, because people aren't used to sharing certain kinds of information, either because they own it, or they think maybe you're not worthy of having that information, or maybe not trustworthy to have that information. If you want to build trust, I would say, um, two great ways to do it are one, be generous, and two, emphasize similarities with people. And the reason I say this is if, if you're generous to people, what you are doing is usually you're evoking feelings of gratitude in them. And the one thing we know about gratitude is, you know, George Zimmel, the famous sociologist, said it's the moral memory of mankind. It's, it's what doesn't let me forget that I owe you something. And in many ways we've shown that it's the emotional engine that drives trustworthiness. Simply feeling grateful will increase my odds of repaying you. So one, be grateful. Two, emphasize similarities. The other thing we know is that the more similar you feel to someone, what that's going to do is all of a sudden make you say, oh, I have something in common with this person. And simply recognizing that increases non-consciously your mind's valuation of helping them. And therefore will increase the odds that you're going to behave in a trustworthy fashion toward them and they to you. There was always a group of people who either by personal constitution or organizational mores are either scared or just unwilling to do that. They, they are unwilling or unable to change. But many of the others really just need support from their leadership that says, no, we want you to do this. This is what's not only acceptable, it's expected. I think there is a shift around the openness and the transparency in organizations and the way that when you look at the tech industry and the concept of open source and multiple people contributing to create something without it necessarily having a distinct leader, that's a shift that I think started in tech, but more and more I'm seeing nonprofit organizations and other large groups start to think about how can we invite more people into our process. People were much more comfortable sharing all the information because they realized how important uh, their dependence was, and it changed this pecking order. You stopped having this stratification that the people who have a certain position in the organization are cool people 
and the other people are not. That started to break down and it became a meritocracy. That whole paradigm of someone having access to secret information, that is over. Everyone has access to information. Now it's about the guy or the woman who knows how to use it best. People were interested in what you did to make things happen. There's constant feedback. You pretty soon knew who was contributing a lot and who was not. And hot air didn't get you very far and hard contributions made a big difference. We're seeing lots of examples now of industries and specific organizations who are saying, well, listen, who do you think knows most about how to run the production line well? Is it the managers in the office or is it the people pushing levers and pressing buttons every day? Do you know what? It's them. Maybe it's naive, but I think the boss in the traditional sense is not required in the teamwork that I envisage and the kind of work environment I envisage. So I think the boss will become a selection of self-chosen mentors and coaches. The role of the leader is maybe more important than ever before because the leader is the orchestrator. The leader is the person who makes it okay and necessary to collaborate. Leaders have got to create an environment in which everybody's contribution is valued and to a certain degree openly celebrated. And the boss's job is to basically go in and make sure, do they have what they need? Are the right people on the team? Are there people on the team I can trust to make these decisions? Am I empowering them in that moment? And have I set a purpose or a vision that's driving them in the right direction? A leader takes the ask and says, right, so what do we do? You guys you have all the skills. And, and the magical, it's a really subtle change, but the magical thing that happens is that all of a sudden, you're engaging the employees. You're saying, I trust you, I, want, I, I need your help to do this. And once they've done that, once they make sure that everybody knows the destination, the outcome that they're looking to achieve, the second thing they do is they get out of the way. It's a new role for most leaders. It's sometimes uncomfortable because it's not quite as carefully scripted. You can't sit in your office write certain memos out, send them out, come out only when you're particularly prepared. You're much more involved all the time. My biggest decision was simply to keep it moving and then to let the organization go where the organization's combined wisdom took it. And what I found was, was much more rewarding to me to see how much we could do cumulatively, how much we could accomplish, and how much I didn't have to put my hands on the tiller, how much I could have as we used to call it, eyes on, hands off. In the past, organizations used to have offices because you just needed a place to put your people and you wanted to see where people were working because if you saw people at their desk, then they were working. But now, because uh, with technology, we can work anywhere, anytime. People have wondered, do we even need an office anymore? When you think about how people work and how people worked throughout history, interaction has been in the center of, of the human experience. When we were hunters and gatherers, the people we worked with were the people we lived with. And you got to know them at a very deep level. A small change in facial expression or tone of voice actually communicated a lot. People need to be around other people. When we're, when we're not, we feel isolated socially. We begin to feel disconnected from our organization and from our work. Humans evolved to work socially, not to work in isolation. What that means is constructing a workplace that pays attention to the social environment. Most innovation is a team sport. Real value, real creativity, real ideas emerge between interactions. The most inventive places are hives of activity. The complexity of the stuff that we do has really demanded this really intense, high volume uh, collaboration between people. And for humans to transmit complex information, I don't just need to talk to you. We need to be on the same page. So we need to be in the same social group. We need to speak the same language. You know, creativity is there. It's just waiting for different people to connect in different ways. We as humans, culturally and biologically, evolved to respond to face-to-face. -to -face. Um, and that's what we still really need today. What I think is interesting when we talk about the future of work is when you compare a city uh, to the traditional corporate organization, the traditional office. You know, the city is a place where you have all sorts of emergent possibilities, where these networks can collide and fuse all the time. Um, so to me, the question is, is how do you make this, the corporation more like a city? Um, how do you create spaces where serendipity can happen? 
more and more people are getting out into the community and connecting with each other and really learning from each other. If you lock people inside a container of work with a bunch of people who work for the same organization, well, you end up thinking the same way. You work for the same company in the same industry with the same customers with the same problems you save, solve in the same way. If I get outside of my organization, I bump into different people. They're going to make me think differently about my work. It's going to lead to much better innovation. In any sort of society or regime or anything that prizes innovation and new ideas above all, you're going to try to come up with new forms of organizing that can unlock all this tacit knowledge in people's heads. Tacit knowledge is, I mean, it's really the lifeblood of society. Tacit knowledge is the reason we have organizations is to preserve that tacit knowledge, to transfer it across people. Employers are now looking at how do we how do we tap into that latent value that's hidden in those employees and create some agility inside the organization to make this happen. Basically, you know, we need to do a better job of, of managing for emergent outcomes rather than efficient outcomes. And it turns out that there's actually been a lot of research showing what kinds of communication patterns, what kind of networks best support the exchange of tacit knowledge. What we've seen over and over again is that space is what fundamentally shapes how we interact. If you sit near someone, you talk to them a lot. If I sit on a different floor from you, I never talk to you. If space can improve how we communicate, that is fundamentally what improves performance and what makes the company money. The workplace is really not about, about a cost. It's not, it's, not, it's not an expense. It's an investment in communication. Office spaces create communication. They create collaboration between people. I don't think we've appreciated how strong an impact that has on the way companies operate. The idea that you can actually create these really natural collisions in the workplace through the roots is, is kind of an important part of our design. So we create these very, very circuitous roots that hopefully bring you about to meet other people. So we'll purposely create extra wide corridors, have a whiteboard close by, and this is all by design. We know that in well-designed spaces, well-thought-out spaces, well-curated spaces, people will hang out there, and that's what we want. But you can't plan for that specific interaction. I can't tell you, hey, you should interact with this person, because I actually don't know if anything good's gonna come out of it. What I can try to do is set up the environment in such a way then eventually the right interactions are gonna happen. And that's what they're trying to do. You know, the flagship case study they did was a call center for Bank of America. Call centers have been managed one way, really since the 1960s. The idea is that we wanna keep you on the phone as much as possible. And anytime you're not on the phone, it's time that I'm losing money. What that means is that if you're on a team of people trying to sell a product, when you're on a break, no one else is on a break. You know, make the call as fast as possible and get them off the line and be purely productive. But it's unclear if that's actually the right thing to do. So what we did with a call center, uh, with Bank of America's call center, is we put wearable sensor ID badges uh, on a number of their employees to measure how they actually collaborate at work. The great insight they got from all that data was have everyone take a coffee break at the same time rather than stagger them out for maximal efficiency so people could chit chat about work. What we found out was that people who had these very tightly knit networks, so you, the people you talk to talk a lot to each other, those people completed calls in half the time as people with the least cohesive networks. It's a massive effect. And all the metrics the Bank of America wanted to achieve, they achieved by letting people talk to each other. For Bank of America, that is worth tens of millions of dollars a year. We talk about skills, and we talk about retraining, and we talk about learning, and there's all these great trendy ways of thinking about you know, how we improve ourselves. And I think the fastest way we do that is to discover people who we have something to learn from and, and learn it from. And that's what tacit knowledge is really about. When it comes to generating the big ideas, the new ideas, it really is about these collisions, these random conversations between people that, that oftentimes go nowhere. But the 1% of times they go somewhere, that's where the big things happen. I go around too many organisational buildings where it feels like a morgue. There is no energy, no pulse. You can hardly see people. So how on earth do you expect energy, innovation, new ideas and collaboration to happen? 
We have inherited a way of organizing our work environments, our physical spaces, that is a direct manifestation of the ideologies of the industrial era of the 20th century. The guiding principle was to maximize efficiency and that clearly manifests itself in those environments. The offices and cubicles we work in, the buildings that they're placed in, the software and the hardware that we use, they're really all designed for a world of information scarcity. Um, a world in which it made sense to protect information, work in hierarchies, to focus on process, and most importantly, to focus on individual productivity. That whole construct is a dead construct really. It belongs to a previous era. You talk to any company and half the desks or cubes are empty and yet you can't book a meeting room for a team to come together. So there's a big mismatch. People want to kind of work together in communities and clusters. There is no physical space to do that. Now the way work has changed is that it's not about just physically being there. It's about creativity, it's about your ideas, and it's about innovation. So we need to think differently about the workplace. Why do we have office buildings? What goes on inside them? And how do we uh, enable people to do their best work? Rather than the work environment just being a place to house your people, the work environment has to be a place to inspire and to facilitate a, a deeper level of collaboration where they have access to technologies that can actually help augment those interactions with other people. We really need to design tools and environments and services that are inherently collaborative from the ground up, that allow us to come together and work like a network, that allow teams to exchange ideas very creatively, and that are centered around human activity it's the big thing now. The office place or the workplace is a big part of the business plan. It's a huge tool. Um, you know, if I get the right people, I get them all on the same page, you know, I'm, I'm going to come up with more innovative ideas. The work environment can be designed in such a way that it can help mitigate some of the distractions that are going on in the workplace, but it can also shape the behavior of the people uh, who are coming to work every day, and it can prime us to be able to stay more mindful and in the moment and actually be able to enhance the interactions that we have with other people. You know, if you look at the design of offices today, there has been or of a move toward you know, openness and flexibility. And the idea there, of course, is that it fosters communication between people, allows people to be more collaborative and so forth, and that is absolutely essential for any kind of creative activity, but it's not sufficient. The challenge with some environments is that in our efforts to really help people be more open and more transparent, that we've forgotten about providing places where people can get the privacy that they need in order to focus on their work. People need dedicated spaces to concentrate, dedicated spaces to collaborate, and a third type of space, places to contemplate, to restore themselves, to rest and relax, not be constantly under supervision or surveyed. We need the ability to move from individual work to collaborative work and back again in a very, very fluid way across devices and across spaces. And I think what we'll find is freedom to choose based around the activity and the task that people want to perform, working in what I would call a polycentric city, a place of many locations for work. The workplace is going to go from just being a, a place that people come to to do their work to actually be a destination that people want to come to because that's where they do their best work because they have access to the people they need and the technology they need to be able to really be their best. We're fostering community, not workforce, so the idea that if we can make it feel like they are wanted, they are honored in this space, um, it can be very successful because when you get people engaged like that, great things happen. There's a correlation between how satisfied people are with their physical work environment and their engagement. The work environment can really be a key strategy to helping people feel a greater sense of belonging and a greater sense of purpose and engagement with their organization.
I would expect workspaces to be that much more meaningful in the future because they would enable us to learn at faster rates, to achieve our potential much faster, to connect with each other in ways that we can today, and therefore arrive at generating value, new ideas, new innovations, maybe faster, but certainly in a more, in a more meaningful way. I hope Workplace will be like a Roman marketplace where people come with their wares, their ideas, from inside and outside the organisation to create new things together, to share information, to learn from each other. So that's what I hope the Office of the Future will look like with retreat space for brief moments of concentration, but basically as a big theatre of innovation. One of the dominant truths of the 21st century is that almost anything you can imagine being done by machine will be done by machine, and what that leaves us is a creative space. We are seeing the increasing computerization of kinds of service work that we thought, you know, 10 or 20 years ago could never be automated. Today, there are many industries and many kinds of human work that are not terribly creative, but that could be profoundly creative, and that creativity could be deeply unlocked with these new tools. When we think about this world of information abundance, it's defined by the immense creative possibilities brought to us by the power of social networks, by this kind of real-time flow of information and new ways of making things. And when we pull all, the, all of those things together, you know, huge possibilities are unlocked. You know, I think one of the things we have to do is redefine the word productivity. We've automated away a lot of the routine work. And so what's left for us, the humans, is a lot of creative work, is a lot of non-routine work. And so suddenly, just doing things really quickly is less important than doing the right things. And so uh, this also explains why it's so much more important that we have engaged and motivated employees. You don't have to go to too many stores to see cashiers that are not engaged, to see people waiting tables that are not engaged, to see white collar workers that are not engaged. In fact, engagement is at an all time low if you sort of track it historically over time. And yet we live in this world of abundance, of ideas, of connection. So there's this huge gap. Actually, yeah, this is Kaz here. How do we get people to care and then to go and sort of live up to their capability as individuals, as team members? We're all asking ourselves, well, what can I bring to the equation that a robot can't? Those things are things like empathy. They are things like an imagination. They are things like curiosity and vulnerability. And so these are all qualities that are really paramount for us as human beings. There are many people who, when they find their greatest fulfillment in their work, they find they're bringing their whole humanity to the task. I'm employed for a specific job description, but do you think that's all I know about? Do you think that's the only experience that I've got to bring to this? A visual artist, they also have ears. <laughs> I also have eyes. You know, we both have minds. When you're in the workplace, there's not always that sense that we can play and be creative in order to find the best solutions, and yet if we did, we would probably be so much more empowered and make so many better choices. So what I see is just this untapped potential energy and it's all because of the systems and processes and mindset that we're using. If we just change the mindset, suddenly there's you know untapped capability, untapped potential that is sort of there at our fingertips, just waiting for us to kind of access it. A successful day at work for me is probably defined by what I would call creative flow. We have a wonderful capacity for dealing with complicated problems that may involve paying attention to several different things at once, but having them all converge on the same kind of creative endpoint. Things are flowing, the muscles are loose, the hearing is clear, and everything is coming in, and I feel like it could be six voices and I can hear all six conversations very clearly and can process them and send it back out. This is something that, especially when you're young, you don't really think about, you just kind of fall into, right? You're gonna get interested in a problem and or if you just look up and 12 hours have passed.
I think we've all had that experience when we're working well of getting into what you know, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi famously calls these flow states. We need to remove barriers uh, and allow this flow to happen across different types of work, uh, across different types of space and across different types of device, and allow people to use all of their natural modalities very, very seamlessly. A lot of people worry that creativity is going to be impacted by the fact we're all hyper-connected these days. One, I think, issue we face in our modern world is, is now being inundated by more information than we can process. We're now tethered to devices that beep at us all day long. 47 reply-alls that consist of two-word answers. And our brains didn't evolve to, to process all these sources of information from multi-screens or from our Google Glass or from everything at the same time, right? We've lost the ability to actually create cognitive space for us to sit and think because the tools make it so easy and so compelling and so engaging. We are now creating in a world in which we are inundated. The, the fears about information overload have all come true. And we are dependent on the very systems that overwhelm us for part of our creative process. And managing the tension and paradox of that is enormously difficult for people. And so the challenge is to figure out how to use them in ways that help users be more focused and mindful rather than be perpetually distracted and fractured. Mindfulness is the, is the buzzword in business these days. It'll, you know, if you read the New York Times, it'll raise your uh, standardized test scores, it'll increase your productivity, all these wonderful things. But another important uh, aspect of mindfulness is it also helps focus attention. Having more information available to me should make me better at doing my job if I can just do a better job sorting through it. Context is an incredibly powerful tool that we can make use of um, using machine learning, filtering, pattern analysis, that type of technology. I think contextual awareness is going to be a very big play for the future. So contextualized information needs filtering. It needs to be contextualized based on our presence and preferences. And that's where the secret of success will come from. We desperately need filtering. Filtering is crucial for us if we are to make sense of all of the just, the just incredible ocean of content that exists around there. This understanding of context in the workplace can really help us zero in on what matters most and can help us embrace this stream of information and, and stream of communications and make the most of it so that we can work creatively with it rather than push against it. I would boil the challenge that workers of the future will face into this phrase. You can be automated or you can augment yourself. Humans have an incredible capacity that has developed over hundreds of thousands of years to offload parts of our memories, to extend our senses, our abilities to think using technology. In interacting with our technologies, we discover new ways of doing things. Technology is a design medium in many ways. So we co-author, co-design, and interact with technologies in new ways, creating new capabilities. You can see this with the history of writing, with musical instruments, with the history of art. All of these are to form part of a grand story of humans using technologies to do things that they could not just on their own. It's really very much part of the story of what makes us who we are.